Thank you, Mingji. Now, please start. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm happy to be giving this talk, although this is pretty challenging time for everybody, I know. Um, especially you in Florida and us in California. And uh, so, I think that this is a time when understanding a lot about data and using the data effectively is particularly important. And I'm going to talk about mostly data which has to do with the microbiome, and in particular, the human microbiome. And so, um, one of the challenges of these types of data is that the data themselves are heterogeneous. And uh, they're all heterogeneous in different ways. And we have a lot of data, which is what we call multi-way data or multi-domain. So, the human microbiome data um, that we're going to analyze <coughs> in this work with, um, was generated um, with David Rollman. And we have several studies which are funded by the NIH and by the Gates Foundation to look at the perturbations and resilience of the human microbiome. We look in particular at the effect of antibiotics, um, perturbations such as clonic cleanout, diet perturbations, and also we've been studying pregnancy and preterm birth using data from the vaginal microbiome. Other studies which involve the microbiome and immune cells um, are we're doing with, with Catherine Brish, and that's also a case where multi-domain interactions are important. So what are the challenges? One is that we need to keep all the data together. The data are heterogeneous, in, and so they're not all just numerical. Some of them are graphs and trees. And so we have this data integration challenge. The other thing is that when you do perturbation studies, we usually do longitudinal data because the subject-to-subject -subject variation is the largest source of variability. So you have to do within subject studies, and that makes the data very dependent. So you can't use ordinary statistical tests, which suppose that the samples are independent. And then we have problems of reproducibility and results across labs and experimental and conditions and users. Um, so the other um, difficulties as a uh, statistician is that we want to do uncertainty quantification because we won't be able to test the results. So the different paths that we use, which have been effective in analyzing heterogeneous systems, is uh, first of all, we use um, objects which have multiple components and we store the data, phylosic uh, in particular and bioconductor. We can use graphs and trees to influence the data, and mixtures um, are a good model because the data don't come from one distribution. So we don't have one parametric population, we have multiple, and that enables us to model the heterogeneity. This heterogeneity actually um, is very useful to think of it in terms of latent variables or underlying factors. Um, that we try to estimate. We don't stress too much about choices in that we use um, reproducible research workflows so that you, a tuning parameter can be changed. But there are choices which are irreversible. And the choices which are ir irreversible are, for instance, um, things which compress the data and, and creating summaries and then throwing out the raw information is irreversible. Um, we also reuse and recycle methods um, and find it useful. So the, in the heterogeneity of the data, you have a status of response or explanatory um, status of the data. So if in case of the preterm birth, for instance, the gestational age is a variable we would like to predict. And um, the preterm birth is, for instance, something that we use. We have supervised methods which try to predict a preterm birth. Um, in many situations in the microbiome, we actually don't have a response variable. So we are not in a supervised learning setting. And in that case, hidden variables or latent variables, which are not measured, um, are the things that we're trying to predict. The different types of data, like continuous, binary, or categorical, can be quite challenging to combine. 
And we also have different levels of dependency. That is, some of our data are time series and some of them are spatial and some data are independent. And then all of us who are working in metagenomics, we have very different technologies which we're combining. So we use currently for the immune cells, we use CYTOF, we use imaging, we have imaging mass spec, we have um, RNA sec for transcriptomics, and then we have ordinary Illumina high sec um, for the microbiome. Now, to say a little bit more, because I know that in Southern Florida, you're particularly interested in microbiome data, um, the, the data that we're currently working with, um, we still use 16S um, RNA sequence. Um, genes specifically for signatures of the bacteria, but we also use a lot of RNA-seq um, to see which genes are being turned on, gene expression and transreptomics. Um, we have targeted and untargeted uh, mass spec data, and we have clinical data. Of course, new, uh, the environmental um, covariates are important, but when you're doing things like mass spec and transcriptomics, the metabolic networks and the gene ontologies and the gene-gene interaction networks are important, as are the phylogenetic relationships between the taxa. So that's a lot of information that needs to be integrated, and I'll explain a little bit our workflow. So when we, for instance, extract the DNA, there's information about the samples that are set aside and then imported that will serve as the descriptors for all of the specimens. And then on the other hand, the sequencing, we have to create what we call now ASVs, but were historically called operational taxonomic units, which were the data um, taxa descriptors. Now, we, as I said, we have this phylogenetic tree relationship, which can either be built from scratch from the sequences, or we can use gold standards like um, gene tree, various kinds of um, green genes or other um, uh, trees between the known bacterial strains. And we have taxonomic information, and we then have the counts of reads per taxa, which is the most important part of this um, uh, data. And we combine all of this into the PhiloSeq package, which enables different types of data to be put together and use standards such as the phylogenetic standards is the eight package. The strings for the DNA strings, we use the bio strings package. And then we make these constructors, which um, enable us to do simple plotting using ggplot and um, ordination methods. Um, we have to compute various distances and plot heat maps and ordination here. So this is just a wrapper, which now allows people to compute um, and um, display uh, preliminary filtered data and relationships between the phylogenetic information, for instance, and the clinical information. Um, here you have the colors of the different types of samples as they appear along the tree. And um, these are very simple, just one line commands in order to do quite complex analysis um, simply. And so here, this is plot ordination where we create um, biplots. Now, of course, our, our accent and the thing that we are trying to spend a lot of time on is the reproducibility aspect. And the reason for that, let me give you a little bit of a background of why we spent so much time creating these R markdown methods for our collaborators to use. Um, and I just want to take an example from the microbiome. So there was a paper that appeared in Nature um, a little more than three years ago on enterotypes, which said that um, you could separate um, the microbial um, communities um, it, according to um, what people were saying in the media to be like blood types, that you had types of enterotypes. And so this was the picture which justified that. So people were clustering. And if you take an example, and in the slides actually, which I made available, there's actually um, an example of the study. Um, the, I won't go through it um, for time reasons, but um, as we went through the study, we did a summary of all the choices that were made by the people analyzing the data. And if you've analyzed microbiome data 
um, yourself, you know that you have to choose a data transformation. Uh, you can't use the raw counts because of different sampling depths. Um, you might use uh, logs or regularized logs, or you might take a subsample or rarify the data. You might take proportions. Um, the other thing that's done is that we take a subset of the samples because some of the samples are outliers. In this study, they declared nine outliers. So they set aside nine of the more than 40 um, samples as outliers. And you can have to filter out certain taxa, some because just because they're unknown, they have unknown labels, others because they're very rare and they only occur in one or two samples. And so you have a choice of threshold and a choice of way doing that filtering. Different distances are used when doing ordination. Um, in vegan or phylosic, there are actually 40 different distances. You can use a chi-square distance, a unifrac distance, a weighted unifrac distance, a break curtis distance, or hamming distance. There are many, many different distances which are ecologically meaningful. Um, some people, when they use presence-absence data, they'll use jacquard distance. So the other thing um, that one has to do is choose an ordination method and number of coordinates. And in that, uh, you could have a multidimensional scaling, the classical principal coordinate analysis, or you could choose to do a non-metric rank-based method, like a non-metric multidimensional scaling. And then you have to choose the number of factors. You choose a clustering method. You choose whether or not to use a continuous variable or categorical variable. You have to choose a graphical representation. And when you summarize this, you get to about 200 million different possible ways of analyzing the data. Now, the big problem with this is you can't use, after doing that, you can't use anything like Benjamini Hofberg or any kind of um, post-selection inference on that number of studies. And so small changes might make only small differences, and you have to know that. And the only way of knowing that is to have a reproducible workflow and make a small change and then find out whether the study is robust. That's how we found that, in fact, that interotype um, results were not at all robust um, to different changes. So we actually don't believe in um, different types or clusters. We meet believe more in a, a spectra, um, more of a horseshoe of the latent gradient. So how can we think about these heterogeneous systems in a constructive way and not trying to oversimplify? And the latent variable approach or latent factors does in, in, enable interpretation. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, it just has to do with the fact that when you have very, very complex structure, it's helpful to find a thread and pull out a thread one at a time. Now, for a statistician, um, we have a way of formulating that. We call these mixtures of distribution. And so I love this XKCD in which um, he says that, you know, you see there's a student T distribution. And then, in fact, the teacher's distribution is a mixture of these. So a mixture of many, many distribution is the more advanced way of doing statistics on this type of heterogeneous data. And it helps to think of this in layers. That is here, if we have a histogram like this, it means that in fact you have three different populations and you have a hidden categorical variable, which is a layer with a high overlap between the pieces that can occur. And then you might have many, many different pieces. And so this is an example where you have as many different underlying pieces as they were observations. And that's what we call an infinite mixture. Um, and that's the gamma Poisson, which is very useful, for instance, in renormalization and modeling the number of uh, reads. So what are the unknown parameters? Um, well, very often it's just the pre prevalence of the underlying taxa. Now, the taxa, I'll show you later why we identify them with strains or what we call amplicon strain variants. Um, and we generate this with our software, which is a denoising software, quite similar to what happens when you use EM. And in that case, you might have two two situations, a treatment set and control set. And what you want is a difference between the treatment and the control prevalences for different taxa. Uh, 
So we want to estimate that difference, but we also need confidence statements and confidence intervals on those statements. And so that's one of the difficulties in just using uh, ratios, um, because if you just use ratios, you, you don't have the standard errors, so you don't have confidence bars on those numbers. So it is important here to separate the model themselves from the data. And there's been some confusion in the microbiome about this. So the model is a probabilistic model where you have some unknown parameters that you try and estimate. But the data, the contingency table which comes in, um, that is the, just the numbers of reads. And so the way you go up from the, the data to the read, you're losing some information um, if you don't maintain um, honestly what the original data were and how much information you need to percolate up in the model. So I wrote with Wolfgang Huber a complete book on the importance of keeping all the data. So I'm not going to go through all the steps. And um, I put here the link to the data, which is free online to the, um, to the book with all different examples for doing this. But you need to separate the data. Um, and in the microbiome case, um, these parameters here are the unknown parameters, but they are not the data. Um, we have to estimate those data. And so though real data are counts, their data are not compositional. And there's been a lot of confusion. There were several papers in the microbiome literature saying that the data are compositional. They're not. Um, we don't summarize them uh, uh, just as ratios or relative abundance. We have to take into account the standard errors of these. Um, the reason for doing that in the case, for instance, of what I was saying, where I study antibiotic perturbations is the total amount of bacterial load um, goes way down after taking antibiotics. So there's not a whole that stays constant. There's not just like a 100%, which is the same across all samples. And so in compositional data, um, you suppose that there's a whole which stays constant over time, and that's not true. There's also the problem that you have different amounts of contaminants in the samples. And so, again, the whole doesn't say in the same whole 100%. You might have 10% contaminant in one sample and 20% in another. The depth bias um, has to be estimated um, using the count numbers. And the variability, as I said, and the standard error also use the quantification. So we prefer to transform the data than, than to say that the data are compositional. So in our count data, for instance, you can see that some, you might have a million reads in some samples and only um, 300,000 in another. So we have this high variability in the standard errors. Now, in our quest to improve the data quality, we also use um, frequencies, the frequencies of the reads. We don't ignore them. And in earlier workflows, in particular in Chime and Mother, um, people used a method which didn't take into account the read frequencies. So the Data 2 pipeline um, allows for higher resolution sample inference. Um, originally, we did this for Illumina, but we have pipelines work for 454 and for PacBio and other platforms. Um, this is to avoid some of the pitfalls which came for the early data in which people thought that there was a much higher alpha diversity, a much larger number of species um, in the biological samples than there actually were. So let me make an analogy which is useful because um, it's a case where after we wrote the Dada um, 2 pipeline, we realized this is really what Google uses when it does word and spelling correction. So if you want to know how many words a person knows, say 15,000 or 20,000, and you're looking at text that they've written out without a word processor, you might have many spellings of the same word. So you want to know how many real words a, perf, uh, a person knows. And you need to use the information of the frequency um, with the idea that the correct spelling is the one that occurs more often. And that's how data 2 works. That is that you start off, um, say that you have two sequences. And I'm just making a picture here to give you an idea of what's going on. These two sequences were 
sequenced at very different depths. The sequence one at a thousand and sequence two say at 10,000 or a hundred thousand. Now the error variability was the same. They have say a Poisson error of one or, you know, there's an error which is the same, but because you have many more of the second one, the blue one, you have many more opportunities for error. So it's going to be much, much broader if you have a high frequency of a sequence. So if you use the standard method, and this is the standard method that people were using for OTUs, which is to say you take a 97% um, similarity, you're creating a radius of fixed size. To Excuse me, Dr. Holmes. Uh, for other people who are not speaking, please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. So the 97% the, the um, similarity um, creates a ball of a fixed radius. So you see it ha occur in this case where you actually have many of the group two, the sequence two, which have not been classified into OTU2 because you haven't taken into account the frequencies. So the baseline probabilities are really important. This baseline probability is hugely important also in a lot of the mistakes that people are making about the interpretation of what's going on with COVID. So I don't know how to stress enough about taking into account baseline probabilities at this point in your studies. So in our probabilistic model, um, we have sample sequences, which is the truth. So on the left, I have what occurs at the truth, and then we have errors that occur. And so here we have an error, which is occurring by multiplying many different um, um, new sequences because there's one or two spelling er errors. And so this is what's signified by this. And here we have a few errors in the red and a few errors in the green. And if you do a standard radius-based analysis like um, Chime, um, UPASS, or Mother, this is what you get. You get two OTUs. However, if you use data two in a probabilistic model, you're able to go back to some of these um, true um, sequences. And this is how it works. That is, we have a probability of um, having either the same, believing that this came from the same ASV. And so the question is, if we know the sequence and this probability, we can compute the probability that this is a, a true mutation or whether this is actually um, just two mistakes which are occurring. And when we compute this probability, we use this quality score, um, which is very important. And currently, SRA is considering, the NCBI is considering getting rid of the quality scores. And we were very worried about that because in our supervised learning tests of everything that we do, we find that the quality score is very important information. And it's very helpful to have the quality score as well. That's what I was saying about compressing the data. You have to be careful if you don't com if you compress the data in a way which loses information, you get lower quality output. So the result of using, for instance, um, um, preterm birth type data where we care a lot about the Lactobacillus crispatus um, um, taxa. Um, when we use data two, we have a much higher resolution and we can see these samples are taken, um, the ones which are next to each other, they're all taken from the same um, patient. And we can see that we have the same strains and practically the same proportions across time in the same patient. We do have a little bit of strain stitching from time to time. So here, this patient has switched from strain L1 to strain L2 um, at the fifth, um, at this, uh, at the fifth um, time point. So the, this gives us a much better um, high quality um, data set to work with. And it allows us to look at transitions between communities. And I'll show you why we care about that. This is a study which was published in PNAS on the temporal and spatial variation of the human microbiota during 
pregnancy. And in this study, we started off, we had 49 pregnant women. We actually set aside nine of the women as our test, as our validation set. So we studied the vaginal microbiome of 40 women. Um, and we're trying to look at the communities which were stable and seemed um, to be associated with a good prognosis in terms of um, uh, uh, term pregnancies. So we created the co-occurrence network, and this is like uh, Jacquard distance. And in this, you see that here we have in rows and columns are the different samples. And we see these samples here um, have very high co-occurrence of the same bacteria, and they're um, associated to a predefined, predefined community state type was actually already known when we were doing Sanger type sequences of this data. Here we have the second um, type, which is very um, well clustered, the third one, and the fifth one. Now, this fourth one, is an outlier in which you have very high diversity. That is, they had very little co-occurrence between the samples. And this is the type here we have in peak, um, whether the births were preterm. So this is a case where very high diversity is um, a bad sign. So in most microbiome studies for the human microbiome, diversity is a sign of good health. And in the case of the vaginal microbiome, it's the opposite. That is, um, high diversity is a sign of a bad prognosis. And here we have a lot of preterm birth. So the questions we were asking were whether we could actually diagnose this early on in the pregnancies and how stable the communities are within an individual. Um, this was the most important question because we wanted to know whether we had biomarkers that would be useful. Um, previously, um, in the known microbial um, community state types, um, we had these latent category and we could see the association. So this is this group one I was talking about, which is um, associated with good um, outcomes. Usually there are a couple of preterm pregnancies here, but mostly, um, and it's actually characterized mostly by the presence of Lactobacillus crispatus, the species that I was talking to you earlier on about. Now, in the second group, it's another Lactobacillus gasseri, which is um, characterized, which is characteristic. Um, and in the fourth group, we don't have any Lactobacillus, which is dominant. We do have actually quite strong um, presence of, lacto of Gardnerella. And the Gardnerella here um, are the one which we actually associated when we did tested with um, within this group um, of um, having preterm birth. And if we look at the community state types from a, a longitudinal point of view, you can see you know, these um, red and pink occurring down here in the short pregnancies. And so mostly that's what it was um, present. So we did a Markov chain model where we're most interested in the transitions. And uh, you can see the most unstable state is the state four in which you had a very large fraction of preterm births. And so we did a lot of different analysis and predictions. And our conclusions were um, that we had this very high uh, Gardnerella, which was present and also ureoplasma. And then we wanted to do um, validations. So one of the things that we learned during this study that when you're doing the metagenomics that you wanted to hold the whole genome, we waited and we didn't do the whole genome um, assemblies for all the different bacteria. We only did them in the bacteria which seemed to be important for our outcome. So we were lazy in some sense. And there was a... a necessity if you're going to be lazy if you have to keep all the strain information all the way through so you keep the exact sequence variances um, and you keep all the information so you don't want to be um, merging into a high level taxa too early on um, we did a follow-up study which appeared in PNAS um, uh, two years ago in which we were able to show that in a different cohort this is a University of Alabama 
Um, we had exactly the same Gardnerella strains which occurred then in the Stanford cohort. And their relative positions in the ordination, for instance, are extremely similar. So we had a very high replication of the, the study um, that occurred. But what we did also was we were able to separate the Gardnerella and Gardnerella strains are not equally associated to the preterm birth. That is, there are strains, um, the strain two and three were more associated than the strain one. And this was important in going in and trying to find what are the genes which are associated um, with, the, with the preterm birth. So that was just one study and showing you in a very simple case where you had a simple community. Unfortunately, many of the communities are much more complicated than that. Um, Maybe I could stop at this stage and ask you um, if you wanted to ask a question, um, because I don't see any chat or anything else on my screen. Um, so uh, if there was somebody who wants to ask a, a, mid, a question in the middle, that would be fine. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Mingji, as you like. Uh, thank you, Sudan. Uh, every, uh, everyone, uh, anyone has a question? Dr. Holmes, I provide the opportunity for a mid-talk uh, question. Yeah. Question from an audience? Oh. Uh, yes, okay. um, I'll, I'll try a question okay. if I can. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to process in, in your presentation is um, the difference in working with a relatively small sample size versus working with maybe a massive or um, potentially even an, uh, at least theoretically an infinite sample size and how the algorithms that you've been referring to here that have uh, been addressing probability issues and error issues, how those would be less necessary if you are looking at, say, 10,000 uh, patients and or looking at the vaginal microbiome for 10,000 persons versus 10,000 persons for say preemies versus non preemies. How yeah. does some of that, um, does some of that, um, is there a way to appreciate mathematically how some of the probabilistic issues would dampen as you increase the sample size? Um, so in the, in the case of preterm birth, uh, it won't make a difference because um, it's a very simple community and there is not more than uh, 50 taxa that are actually playing in here. And so it won't change. That is, it doesn't get uh, more complicated. You get more strains involved. And so it gets a little bit more complex. But, but um, that's the case of this very simple community that I just started with, with preterm birth. And all the algorithms that, I, that we develop, they scale up. That is, we have uh, tens of thousands of samples. Um, we do subsampling when we come to defining the ASVs. Um, and we take a subset for doing the model for fitting the model. And then once you fit the model, you use the same model on all your samples, even if you have, you know, 100 gigabytes of data. So um, there's no difficulty. Everything's done um, in parallel, so we don't have any computational difficulties. There is a case where it's going to make a huge difference, and that's the one I'm about to talk about. And that's where you have very, very complex communities. And, um, and that was the motivation in some sense as we moved on from these simple vaginal communities um, for preterm birth to the, uh, the ones in the, the gut and the intestine and much more complicated environmental samples, then you get into the case where, in some sense, you have the infinite taxa model, the infinite ASV. So it's a good question, and I'll, I'll, uh, it motivates what I'm going to talk about now. So that's great. Thank you for the question. OK, thanks. Okay, so um, the model, the simple models that we use originally, we, people have been using the Dirichlet and the multinomial mixtures. And um, we started to use these Dirichlet multinomial mixtures 
And in that case, of course, as I was just saying, you have a finite number of boxes. Um, and the Dirichlet allows you to have a variability in the probabilities. Unfortunately, the Dirichlet multinomial doesn't work well for this type of data. And I'll show you a little bit why. Uh, one of the things is you can get variability in the proportions here. But once you've defined the Dirichlet and you have a probability, you can't have um, probability of the boxes being dependent. There's a very small dependency due to the fact that the number of balls that you're throwing into the boxes um, is fixed. And so they'll be negatively correlated, but it's sort of the second order. But you can't have very strong um, um, dependencies. And what we found um, in our data sets was that actually the multivariate dependencies in bacterial communities preclude the use of a simple multinomial. And that is some tags are quasi-exclusive. That is, practically, you won't find Lactobacillus and Crispatus and Gardnerella in the same samples. Um, and that's something you can't model with a multinomial. Um, you have a lot of co-occurrence that occurs for us for what we call syntrophy, which is in fact that you have some bacteria which only thrive in the presence of another bacteria which produces what it needs. So for instance, uh, uh, methadonogen uh, bacteria are necessary, or that you have situations um, we see it in the oral microbiome um, that um, when you have um, periodontitis, um, we have methanogens. So you always find a syntropic partner in that case. And so the multinomial as a model um, doesn't work for these two reasons. One is you don't have a finite number of boxes. And the second one is a much worse one is this um, non-independence. Um, so that's where the new model, the latent variable and topic model comes in. And so we have to use these mixtures, but um, we have a mixture model in a topic mixture model. Um, every sample is composed of several topics. And so in the example I showed you before for the preterm birth, we, we said each sample corresponded to a type, a community state type. And now we're going to say each sample can have several types, several topics. Um, and we were inspired in doing this um, by what people were doing in natural language um, processing. There was a very good generative model, um, which was done by David Bly, in which you say, okay, you're going to pick topics at random among a certain number of possible topics, and then each topic corresponds to a different probability distribution for many words. And for us, each topic will correspond to a community, bacterial community. And within this community, the bacteria will have different probabilities. And then we can pick uh, an ASV according to these probabilities. So that gave us a generative model. And I'm going to show you the interpretation that we are able to do in a case of antibiotic um, um, study, which is quite difficult. Um, to, to interpret to begin with. When we did an ordinary ordination on this data, we said the same patients are in the same color here. And this is under antibiotic stress and under non-stress. But this is all that the ordination gave us. That is, there's a difference, but we couldn't really understand this antibiotic stress as it was. Um, with the data on ordinary ordination. It compressed everything together too much. We could see that this patient F had much less um, of a um, perturbation than the other patients, but we couldn't say anything really useful. And so what we did was with Chris Sanker and we wrote this package for doing a parallel between document topics and community analysis. And so what is the parallel? Well, our sample or our specimen corresponds to one document. And in the document, we have reads and uh, they correspond to the words. And the words in some sense correspond to terms. So you can group the words if they correspond to various versions of the same term. And this is what we do with the reads. We, they correspond to the different ASVs or species or strains. 
And then these species are assembled in communities and in text analysis, you have the terms are assembled um, in topics. So you might have a document which um, a document from the web say where you have a lot of words which are uh, legal words uh, uh, um, which have to do with contract and um, proponent and player and you might have a whole set of words which are also um, sports words like games on balls and participation and and so this document might be a document which has two topics. Uh, it might be a contract about a sports team um, and that has both sporting and legal terms. And so that document has the possibility of having um, words from both of these topics. And then you can understand it better. And so this is the same for ensembles. That is that they can have several communities in them. So this method, um, where we did a parallel between the topic and community analysis has really helped us a lot with our interpretation and with the case um, in co topic analysis, the number of words um, is not finite. And the, you, do, you have an infinite word model, so you don't have to be restricted. And as you increase the number of specimens, you don't have a problem. You could have tens of thousands of documents, you analyze them in the same way. And so our model, our statistical model, is this latent Dirichlet allocation. It actually has occurred twice. Um, this has been um, also used in genetic mixed membership models um, uh, by Jonathan Pritchard and co-authors in 2000. And David E. Bly, in some sense, reinvented it because he didn't know the biology literature. And we can do posterior inference in variational approximations. We use the Gibbs sampler. But what we we see is that the observed microbiomes um, can be seen as mixtures of underlying community types. And just to say a few words about the mathematics, I won't belabor this. This is all done in the biostatistics paper, which appeared um, two years ago. But we have, in some sense, um, a dual randomness. We have a randomness in the documents or in the taxa, in the different spe specimens. And we have this randomness here at the level of which uh, the different strains are present. And so we have a hierarchical model for both um, the rows and the com columns. And that gives us a way, uh, we have a generative model and we can estimate the parameters. So we have a mixed membership of the, uh, the documents um, ac according to different, they have um, the different taxa, and then we have different community types. And these are the observations that you see. So in this case, we do use multinomial but here we have this variation and we have these nested multinomial. Uh, and this variation allows us to say that we can have very high correlations because you hope could have a topic in which you just had two um, species of bacteria and the, the say that they were half and half and then enable us just to make very correlated uh, a topic with very correlated bacteria, which allows us to model the syntrophy. Now, there's an actual um, extension of the topic model, which is needed for the anti-correlation, which is um, the correlated topic models. And you can make some topics be anti-correlated with other topics. But this, is, this has been a very good um, method for us for understanding how the bacteria assemble. So in this case of antibiotic perturbation, I'm just showing you for one patient what um, the topics were. And so here we had the most important topic, the largest topic, which participated the most. Um, we had uh, bacteria, which during the, before the antibiotics and three days after the antibiotic perturbation, they were sort of at a normal level. And then we have this big drop for these bacteria, which were um, perturbed by the antibiotics. And then we have, uh, slowly they come back. And then when we give a second course of antibiotics, we have a drop, but they dropped and came back much quicker. 
So this is a resilient uh, bacteria in some sense after the second course of antibiotics. And then we have other sets of bacteria which um, drop down but come back much, much quicker and then hardly drop down at the second time. And so we can see in these different topics the different behavior of these different bacteria. And here we put the coefficients of the bacteria. We can see them. Now, I've colored them according to the phylogenetic tree, that is the family. And we've arranged them in order according to the families. And so you see that, for instance, um, in topic one, we have a very high representation of ruminococcus. Um, and then, for instance, in topic three, not at all. In topic two, a few of the ruminococcus about participating. And we went in and looked at which ones because we were interested in them. But we much have a, a much higher resolution understanding. And the other thing which is very useful in this is that because we have this problem with strains, we have a lot of strain switching which occurs. And this is very similar to what happens in the use of words in text. That is that um, we have synonyms. That is one strain is playing the function of another strain. And that if you just do differential abundance of strains, you don't see it because of the strain switching. But in topics, we do see it. And we can see the synonymous um, strains occurring in the topics. So it's a much easier representation. And for, in regards to the question that was asked before, when we have much, much more complex and much more um, abundant um, ASVs, um, this gives us a way of having a much more complete picture. And so we use this um, method in all the complex communities. So just to show, this is what the longitudinal data look like for the different strains within the topic. So this is topic one. And I said, um, they're the ones that are very influenced by this first course of antibiotics. So you have this big drop. And we can see that it occurs um, across many families. So it's not family dependent. Um, and but we do see the specific and here the ruminococcus again, where we have this second um, uh, drop, but not so much. So we did do a generalization, and I won't belabor this because it goes into um, a much more complex statistical um, framework. But the idea here is you have an infinite um, model, so it's non-parametric. Um, and so the number of OTUs is variable, and we can do this with a Bayesian extension. We use this in order to generate many, many samples from the posterior distribution. And this paper appeared in JASA. It's a Bayesian non-parametric ordination. And it does have an advantage, that is, we can give confidence regions around the different factors that occur, like topics, and they're an extension of the topics, and I won't give the model too much. One of the challenges that it does occur for us is that if you do this um, in a simple way, you have this uh, problem that the rotations um, are not identifiable, and so the, what you get when you do the projections is quite a mess. So if you project the many, many posterior samples, you get something very unsatisfactory. These are community state types of the vaginal microbiome. And in order to solve that problem, we use an extension of something that's like registration. You have to find what the summary um, state is and project all of those summaries using um, a coefficient. A uh, it's like a, an angle between the different tables. I'll just show you the output because <coughs> it's very satisfactory. So then um, the output that we get here shows us that the um, projections are very, very stable, and we're very sure about their situation in the ordination here, except for these um, these few ones which are in community state type two. So we went back and we looked at what was specific about these samples. And it, it, it turns out that these were samples that were done at much lower depth. They only had about um, less than 10,000 reads in them. And so we can see that in order to have um, high certainty about where things are projected, you also need um, a high sequence depth. 
So it was useful to see the uncertainties with regards to that. Uh oh, okay. Yeah, I've lost. That's interesting, but okay. Um, so I just want to summarize, and I would say that in statistics, a premature summarization is the root of all evil. And we don't only generate p-values. We have to do uncertainty quantification. Um, and um, the whole set of supplementary material that I generated for doing all of these studies, it, all of this is available. And I sent um, my PDF with all the links to the... Um, to to Jerry. So you have all of this and we can put it up. I have this, um, which I don't understand, but I'm sorry about that. Okay. So I just want to thank the people I've worked with and I benefited enormously from a, a strong bioconductor and our community. And this is my lab group. And, um, and David Relman, with whom I do a, a lot of my different biological microbiome studies, and my graduate students, and in particular, Chris Sankaran and Pratipa, who participated. Um, and um, the PhiloSeq package was developed by Joey when he was a postdoc. And that's a project which um, we keep on updating. And if you have questions, we can ask questions about that. And so maybe I can stop sharing. I don't know how to do that, but we'll see um, if that's possible. And then I can maybe, let's see. Um, and stop right. sharing. Okay, right. now I, I stop sharing. And then maybe um, I can see people or people can see me. Um, and, uh, so is that okay? If you would like to ask questions, now is a good time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Uh, okay. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, any questions from the audience? I see a George Blank has his hand up. Uh, George already asked the question. Yeah, that was from before. Thanks. Oh, okay. 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 Hello? Yes. I, I thank you for a really great presentation. Um, so I'm interested in the question you raised in the second half of your talk. When the community is complex and more interlinked, and the parameter we see actually are not independent from each other. Yes. And uh, I think Right now, we compartmentalize the issue into some communities are looser than the other. But um, that is a not where defined the line, I think, when we talk about microbiome, especially host associated. Is a, the, there is a different degree of mutual exclusion, like you showed the example of Gardenella and uh, Bacillus. And uh, uh, archaea, they perform a lot of uh, syntrophy. You, when we see them in a dense community, it's almost a given. Oh, you can't hear me. I see you took your earphone or something. Yeah, I don't hear very well. There's some background noise, but I think um, so. Yeah, I, I think you were asking questions about interaction with the host. N no, among themselves. Oh yeah, no, but that's the whole idea of doing the topic model. Yeah. Um, but so that my, my question is, that, um, how many, how, what kind of community should we assume they can be truly independent of the relationship? So I don't understand. So the whole idea was to make communities where um, within each community. You have, it's like a topic that you have a particular probability distribution for the different bacteria, which allows you to have correlated bacteria. That is bacteria which are often found to co-occur. And then between these different communities, you can also have relationships 
That is, some communities exclude other communities and some communities work with other communities. Yes. And so I think that it's useful to think about the text analysis analogy to understand how that works. That is, you can have in a topic, you can have to some topics which occur very often with other topics. Yes. And, and some topics never occur with other topics. So that's why we found this topic analysis method extremely useful. Now, as to the question of how many topics? Well, we use a Bayesian method. Um, we, we're very loose about how we define the number of topics. What we find is the number of topics is going to increase with the number of samples. That is, if you have 100 samples, you might only have seven topics. Mm -hmm. But if you have 10,000 samples, you're going to have many, many more topics because it gets quite complex. And so the number of topics does increase with the number of samples. And then, of course, we've used the topic analysis also in the case where we found some of the topics to be contaminant topics. Mm -hmm. so, so we have um, contamination analysis, um, where we found that, in fact, some of the topics are just due, due to a reagent or cross-contamination. So the topic analysis allows you to take into account this co-occurrence. And the big advantage of the method is that it was made for counts of words, and it doesn't care about the length of the document. That is, you can have some documents um, in topic analysis which only have 2,000 words, and you have other topics which are books, or other documents which are books which have um, 50,000 words or 100,000 words. And it, it knows how to handle that. That's not a problem. So that's been a big advantage. The choice of number of topics is something that we have done by creating a hierarchy, um, a Bayesian prior on it. But um, usually it just comes out of the data. OK, that's very helpful. So can I assume there is a common set of topics in the majority of the human microbiome study we conduct. Um, I know the number is going to go to infinite uh, once uh, we accumulate enough samples, and some are more meaningful than the others, some are contaminations, and some are probably stochastic. But yes. there, I think, can we say there is a core set of topic when it comes to human microbiome studies? Yes. At right now, we do not consider the problem that way at all. Most of the paper we write, we treat them as independent. No, we don't treat them as independent. I treat them. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, any you. other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Yin Yin Xia from the University uh, at, in Law at Chicago. I have two questions uh, about it. Yeah, thank, first of all, thank you so much for Dr. Hermes, yeah, for your expertise. Actually, you pi uh, piloted this study. We are the microbiome committee get a very benefit for that. I have two, especially the two questions. One, I want to get your advice about verification or normalization for microbiome data. Our second question is, about uh, the approach we should be uh, or follow. One is the candidate modeling. I think you you know prefer the candidate modeling. Another one is compositional study. So the first question is, do you still you know don't recommend re recommend to the user very verification? So so. The first study, the first question you ask is about normalization, right? Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so um, it, there's not just one way of normalizing. It depends what microbiome you're analyzing. Mm -hmm. So if you have a finite predefined number of ASVs ahead of time, um, you can use a normalization which uses, uh, which presupposes in some sense that you're having a, a gamma poisson and the best normalization for a gamma poisson with a, you have a depth factor which you take out. And then we use a transformation, which is usually a variance stabilizing transformation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we can look at differential abundance. 
of different um, samples after that. So that that's in the context of um, a small number of ASVs and a depth which is not too variable. Now, in a situation when you have many, many reads and you have many ASVs, then you can't use that method because you can't suppose that the ASV number is finite. So we don't normalize. We just use um, a topic. Okay. Uh, and so we define the topics and you can test and you can ask, is this topic different or differentially abundant, this topic, between the, the two different groups, the treatment group and the control group. But you see, there's not one solution. There's not one solution to saying, oh, I know I have to normalize this way. Mm. Sometimes when we are looking at data, we transform all the data into zero, one, presence, absence. Mm. And we just do jacquard distance on presence, absence, and we test on presence, absence. And that's often the case if you're doing rare species or, you know, and you don't care to quantify. So I would say there's not one solution to th that question about normalization. That is, sometimes we do rank-based normalization where we rank everything and we use the ranks instead of the abundances because that's the most robust way of doing the transformation. So there are many different levels at which you can do the transformation and it really depends on the complexity. Mm -hmm. First of all, the number of samples you have. Second of all, the number of ASVs you expect to have mm -hmm. once you've denoised and you have to denoise carefully. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's the first question. So tell me again the second question. Uh, second thing was, I just want to, what approach you prefer? Use the, you know, based on count approach, count get approach, or use a compositional approach? So I never, ever, ever use a compositional approach because mm -hmm. the data are not compositional. Okay. All, all my data come from situation. So compositional data was defined by Aitchison in a very particular situation. It's for metrology and chemistry, where you have, say, um, a chemical um, sample of soil, mm -hmm. and you predefined ahead of time all the chemical components, and it's a predefined number, say 25. You're going to look at carbon, nitrogen. So you predefine it before you get the data. You have a and every sample, you have the same number, say one gram or mm -hmm. 20 grams. Okay, yeah. so that's compositional data. That's what it's defined for. So the premise for compositional data is you go in having predefined the chemical components. So you have a finite number of boxes. And the second one is that you have always the same amount of uh, in your, so 10 grams or one gram. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens in the microbiome is we define the ASVs from the data and potentially they're, mathematically they're an infinite number. It's like in genetics, you have infinite and now allele models. So it's not a finite number of boxes and the amount that you have is always different. And it doesn't solve it um, to just to say, oh, I'll take the relative abundance because people drop from the relative abundance, the contaminants and the unknown ASVs. Mm -hmm. So the, the one, the whole is not the same. So none of the assumptions behind compositional data are met. For the, for, so that's why we went with topic analysis. Because mm -hmm. we could never get, um, we can never use, uh, and I've used, by the way, I worked in soil science and I've used compositional data and I know how to use it. It's not the problem. It's the yeah. problem that the assumptions aren't valid. Yeah, I, yeah I'm totally agree. Actually, the composition study, the technical is the problem, you know. They are, you know, zero, you know, cannot get in the log, you know. Log zero is undefined. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, hearing none, uh, let's thank Dr. Holmes again. And this has been a wonderful talk. Uh, and also thanks to everyone who come today.
Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to meet you someday. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are most welcome. Most Thank welcome. You. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Good luck. Stay. I have.